You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday 24th of October 2014. UK men charged with child sex exploitation offences to stand trial. Victim exposes Leeds grooming ring as police warn scandal not confined to Rotherham. Child sex gangs a problem in Birmingham for 40 years, council told. What happens when they pay attention? Number of ones with child sexual exploitation cases quadruples in one year. Over 700 foreign crime suspects arrested in crackdown. Why didn't they stop them at the border? Bedfordshire woman arrested on terror charges relating to Syria. Attack on Pakistani immigrants. Greece prosecutor seeks trial for 70 Golden Dawn members. Thought for the day. Is nationalism dead in the UK? And finally, some humorous points for the weekend. UK News. Men charged with child sex exploitation offences to stand trial. Two men charged with child sexual exploitation offences are due to stand trial on December the 1st. Azim Ahmed, 23 of Diamond Road, Slough, and Esma Tulla Haidari, 45 of Farm Crescent, Slough, were charged in March after investigation into alleged child sexual exploitation. Ahmed was charged with eight offences of sexual activity with a girl and Hadiri charged with six offences of sexual activity with a girl from January and May last year. They have both pleaded not guilty to all charges and have been released on bail before the trial at Reading Crown Court. World at eight. This is getting to be more widespread than ever, probably due to the rise in immigration over the past few years. The two run hand in hand, it would seem. Victim exposes Leeds grooming ring as police warn scandal not confined to Rotherham. There could be many more cases of child sex abuse like that uncovered in Rotherham, where at least 1,400 children were sexually exploited, a leading police officer has said, as the victim of a grooming ring in Leeds came forward. The scale of the scandal is likely to be higher than previously thought, Norfolk Police Chief Constable Simon Bailey added, with tens of thousands of victims of the crime each year in Britain. Mr Bailey, the National Lead Officer for the Child Protection and Abuse Investigation, told The Guardian the issue of child sex exploitation had, for too long, been a hidden crime. He said, we don't know for sure, but I think it's tens of thousands of victims a year of an appalling crime. Mr Bailey said there may be more cases elsewhere in the country, like that recently uncovered in Rotherham, where at least 1,400 children have been exploited between 1997 and 2003. Meanwhile, a victim of sex abuse has accused Bernardo's of blaming her for an incident which took place when she was a teenager in a flat owned by the charity. The woman, who is now aged 37 but was 16 at the time of the abuse, which she said took place in Leeds at the hands of a gang of men who had groomed her, said she is disgusted at a letter from a charity worker that criticised her. Speaking to Sky News, the woman, who had just recently left a care home before the abuse, told of a letter received in 1993 which stated that the situation could have been avoided if she had not been party to the antics of a group of young men. The woman said she'd been given drink and drugs before being assaulted. World at eight. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Yeah, there in speaks an ostrich with his head firmly in the sand. That's what nationalists have been telling the UK for years and, as usual, accused of being racists. It is more racist to try to overrun a country with foreigners than preserve your own culture, isn't it? Child sex gangs are a problem in Birmingham for over 40 years, council told. Vice Chairman of the Birmingham Safeguarding Children Board, Diane Reeves, said victims had come forward talking of grooming activity going back four decades. She spoke at Birmingham City Council's Cabinet meeting as the city hosted a conference of agencies and professionals working to tackle child sexual exploitation. The Mail told last week how a bombshell police report claimed 75% of known on-street child sex groomers in the West Midlands were Asian, and a total of 82% of victims aged 14 to 16 were said to be white. The report echoes fears that Rotherham and Rochdale-style grooming had been happening on a similar scale in Birmingham and the West Midlands. 
World of Day, love it. Asian now includes all millions of Chinese, Filipinos, Malays, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Thais and a plethora of other migrants from the Asian continent. Why not hit the nail on the head at long last and say Muslim? What happens when they pay attention? Number of Wandsworth child sexual exploitation cases quadruples in one year. Borough Police dealt with 55 cases of youngsters considered at risk of child sexual exploitation, CSE, during the 2013-2014 financial year. They dealt with just 12 cases the previous year. The recently published annual report of Wandsworth Safeguarding revealed from May 2013 to April 2014, the Council's Sexual Exploitation Multi-Agency Panel, CMAP, reviewed 51 cases of child sexual exploitation aged from 12 to 18. Four of the youngsters were boys and 47 were girls. It said, high-profile cases such as Rochdale and Birmingham remind us that we need always to be vigilant about this matter and ensure we have rigorous procedures in place to address this issue and keeping children and young people safe from sexual exploitation. Detective Inspector Richard Milton, Public Protection Portfolio at Wandsworth Police, said, with the recent investment and uplift in bespoke training of frontline and secondary investigation teams, staff of Wandsworth Police recognise the incidents of child sexual exploitation are not always straightforward and signals of risk are not always clear. However, with an increase in awareness and peripheral concerns, this has led to an uplift in officers recognising and reporting concerns over child sexual exploitation. Combined with community engagement, and training with partner agencies, Wandsworth has seen a fourfold increase in the identification and reporting of these offences. World well, date, well, Inspector Milton, this is what the police should have been doing for the last 30 years. Over 700 foreign crime suspects arrested in crackdown. Why didn't they stop them at the borders? More than 700 foreign crime suspects have been arrested after Birmingham became the centre of a Europe-wide police operation. Officers from eight different countries flew into the West Midlands to help catch overseas criminals operating in the region. Police raided a brothel in Coventry earlier. It forms part of a UK-wide crackdown dubbed Operation Trivium, and since its launch on Monday, a total of 2,304 cars have been stopped nationally, 256 seized, and 729 people arrested. A further 958 were handed on the spot fines for minor traffic offences, cautioned or summoned to court. A 51-year-old Polish man in Smethwick was arrested on suspicion of being involved in a fraud of around £11,500. A police patrol was led to an address after the car linked to the suspect activated automatic number plate recognition, ANPR, cameras in Birmingham city centre. He will now be taken to Westminster Magistrates Court and faces deportation to Poland to face the charges. A 24-year-old Polish man from Worcester, wanted for domestic abuse, assault and theft in his homeland, was arrested on Monday morning, just hours after his European arrest warrant was authorised. He'll be removed from the UK within 10 days after consenting to his extradition. These examples illustrate how we're working with European police colleagues, Europol and the National Crime Agency to catch and deal swiftly with foreign crime suspects. From Superintendent Paul Kesey, West Midlands Police. World at eight. It is just too damn little too late when they're allowed to come here after all. Why aren't they caught at the border? Oh, I forgot. It should have been called Operation Trivia because they seem just to catch the Eastern European ones. Are they colour blind? Bedfordshire woman arrested in terror charges relating to Syria. Police have arrested a 25-year-old woman on suspicion of preparation of terrorism acts in connection with Syria, Scotland Yard has said. Counter-terrorism officers took the young woman from Bedfordshire to a central London police station where she remains in custody. Two addresses in Bedfordshire were being searched as part of the investigation. Police said the investigation is related to Syria. The arrest comes after four men appeared in court last week charged with terrorism offences. Details of the charge included swearing allegiance to ISIS, who have seized large swathes of Syria and Iraq and conducting hostile reconnaissance on policemen or soldiers on the streets of London. On Tuesday, London Police Chief Bernard Hogan Howe said at least five Britons were travelling to Iraq and Syria every week to fight for the militant group, with some 500 Britons believed to already travel to the region to join the fighting.
Mark Rowley, Britain's National Police Spokesman for Counterterrorism, said police had made 218 arrests this year and that detectives were carrying out security investigations at an exceptionally high pace not seen in years. World at Eight comes as a double blow as the name of Lee Rigby will not feature on his memorial stone. What will they put? Probably Allahu Akbar. European News Attack on Pakistani immigrants, Greece prosecutor seeks trial for 70 Golden Dawn members. The Golden Dawn movement is accused of attacks on Communist Party and immigrant Pakistani workers in Crete. A Greek public prosecutor has recommended that 70 members of the Golden Dawn movement, including 18 deputies elected to the country's parliament in 2012, stand trial according to a legal source. Prosecutor Isadoras Dogiadis outlined the order in a 700-page legal document on Thursday, which listed the group's criminal activities, including the high-profile murder of an anti-fascist rapper Pavlos Vissis, attacks on members of the Communist Party and immigrant Pakistani workers in Crete. Among those who Dojiakis recommends to face trial is the Golden Dawn leader Nikos Makilaliakis, who was arrested after the killing of Fissis in September 2013 and has been held in jail ever since. Dogiakis' year-long investigation began after the murder of Fissis, a crime which shocked Greece and forced authorities to crack down on Golden Dawn after years of mounting concern about the party's actions and popularity. The prosecutor's findings will now be studied by a panel of three judges and a decision is expected within the next two months. Any subsequent trial could begin next year, according to legal sources. World date, an anti-fascist rapper, needs shooting anyway in my book, shouldn't have done his songs near a popular fascist organisation, should he? This will be a Greek stitch-up, making sure that Golden Dawn do not have their dawn. There is no world news today. Thought for the day, is nationalism dead in the United Kingdom today? One must be realistic, I tell myself, as I sit here, having resigned my position within the BNP, that I've held for nearly ten years as South East Regional Secretary. In fact, the entire South East office has been closed because all the officials resigned as of two weeks ago. We didn't throw our toys out of the pram, and indeed it was not because of a lack of an official and legal election for a chairman, which should have taken place 28 days after that EC meeting. It wasn't because the HQ up north are now no more than Barra boys clinging on to a long soul back. Arrow. And indeed, it certainly wasn't because NG was expelled, as indeed many good men and women have been sent off the res. It might have been all of those reasons or just one. And the one reason we all went was because all our South East email addresses had been purged for two days, with no reason from fiddles with IT. With no official BMPSE email site, our office was finished anyway, so we thought we'd save them any problems in the new Conduct Committee office. Simples, really. All the splinter groups, all the infiltrators and all the traitors that have co-joined to bring down Nick Griffin have in fact succeeded in bringing down the only, at one time, viable alternative to our Marxist diversity-ridden proletariat in this country, the British National Party. I said many thoughts ago that our job as ethnic nationalists had been done and we had acted more as a pressure group than the various and many pressure groups that think just walking the streets with a few leaflets or doing a website jihad is doing the job. It doesn't. But we did. And there are still many in the BNP who have worked long and hard at promoting the party and the message rather than promoting themselves with getting arrested, going to court and generally filly-fallying around it like the last stages of Pompeii before the real shite hit the fans. Self-promotion is always a very rocky road to climb and needs a true professional. Otherwise, it just looks like a selfie on a larger scale in it. The BNP London organiser told me that the SE resignation was greeted with joy by what is left up there. So here I am, unloved and unwanted, and there's nothing sadder than a nationalist on the rock, so to speak. Boo-hoo, and nobody wants me at all. Enough of the self-pity. Never a good look even on someone not over the sodding hill. So my phone is not ringing off the hook with offers of promoting the world at eight, or going to talk, or even joining something else. So I must take that the only way I will... Job done and relax.
But of course, that is easier said than done when you've been fighting in a corner for the last 10 years and have met some wonderful people, and also some bloody awful ones, travelled around and attended excellent meetings, and some others not so good, when all the bloody men who should have been sitting down and listening were out in the pub watching the footy. And we had to have our security men in to create a crowd, and I kid you not, bless them, they sat all through it without a murmur. Now that is devotion and loyalty, which we have not seen since. Now, in the establishment's haste to demolish the BMP and Nick Griffin, they've done something much worse. They've taken away hope. And while we had hope, we had a future. Now that hope has been immersed in a lovey-dovey, diversity, multiracial satire of a political mass that makes Save the Children look like a group of lutricateurs at the scaffold, I am, of course, talking about UKIP in all its wonderful purple pound sign glory. Ten years ago, if any party leader had even mentioned the dreaded word immigration, he would, like Michael Howard, be pilloried and made to resign. Since Enoch and his wonderful speech, the entire power base of this country, ably helped by the EU, have stamped on normal patriotic thoughts like they're the words of the Antichrist himself, with Nick G in the starring role. And true, I hitched my wagon to him and still think that despite some of his pre-warned and ignored disasters, that NG is the only viable alternative to the crap we have to show for it now. I have spent many a good thought in telling it like it is, and knowing that as soon as NG was disposed of, not only would the rats come out of the woodwork, but a goodly number would leave their alternative hives and retire. Now that, not only do they see their job as done, but they could take their money and sod off into the hinterland with their families. You know, it is really a case of the working class can kiss my ass. I got the chairman's job at last. So here we are, a band of ex-nationalists sitting with the wagons around them, not fending off arrows, but thinking what the hell has happened. And to understand what has occurred, you have to go back several years, to the times on the res when the hunting was good and the chief was respected. But this was not good enough, and the traitors within and the establishment knew that to let this continue would be the end of their dreams for a multicultural society and an ironed-out and flaccid political arena, with the media only concerned with either dying people or raising money for foreigners. So they concocted a new idea, or rather a new party with old ideas, that would become acceptable to a degree to the great British public, and once elected to power, all these radical ideas would become just so much pie in the sky. So UKIP was formed, infiltrators were brought into the BNP, plus the Chinese whispers that caused so much trouble and unrest. The scene was set. It only had to get NG into the EU to get rid of him for five years, and whilst the cat is away, the rats certainly played. I had a dream shortly after I joined the BMP, and I told NG about it. It concerned a lovely large yellow and headless lion, sitting on a fence in a field, being tormented by black tumbleweeds. I stepped up to him and felt the blood on his shoulders where his head had been. It was one of the most real dreams I've ever had. This was, of course, headless nationalism, and a self-fulfilling prophecy, which I had hoped would never come to pass. But it did. Apart from the inevitability of many against one, it has been the actual idiocy of the great British public themselves who have helped kill proper nationalism. Who do they think will man the barricades during the next revolution? Or do they think it will all happen on Facebook or Twitter? Do they actually believe that all the economic mistakes, the immigration stats and the general diverse nature of our society will just sort itself out with the help of UKIP? Do they think that at least three generations of migrants who have been living off the fat of our land for the last 40 odd years will just quietly go to Heathrow and jet off into the wilderness of their homelands? Without some form of nationalism in this country, the troubles of the Third Reich and the six million bodies of which we are reminded about with monotonous regularity from the media will pale into significance with the 80 million Muslims in Europe and on our doorstep. Without a much stronger presence in the world than that of a sorting house for the disabled, ethnically challenged and multi-sexed people that we are all exhorted to be, London could end up looking like the Congo on a very bad day. And I'm discounting the Ebola crisis which could already be here, for all we know. So in a way the UK itself has killed the Golden Goose which might have saved it, and it has done it in the worst way, allowing it to happen. Nationalism, true nationalism has died, and it has been killed by selfishness and stupidity. 
I'm not saying that many of our people do not feel something for this country, if not their immediate neighbours, but it pales besides B&Q, Ikea and the lo local supermarket. The web is now open to the hoi polloi, one might say, who used to walk around the local high streets in the daytime and are now sitting in their very well-decorated homes at their PCs, ordering like their lives depend on it. And the thoughts of this country being near the brink of extinction, of its culture, religion and history, don't even enter their heads. It's merely a glitch on the TV programming, matey. And it is because of this I am sad. Not for ten years wasted on trying to instill some patriotism into a people who clearly never had any, unless it was for a football team, but because the future without it looks grim, and not the happy clappy wheeling our trolleys round, looking at the next awful mass extrusions of so-called pictures for walls from China, or cheap lampshades because we deserve it. What we do deserve is probably what we will get. A rotten, useless succession of governments, an ever-increasing mass of foreigners who will take over the rest of the country as they've taken over the main cities and our capital. A worn-out and ethnically challenged NHS, employment only for foreigners of all colours, even white, totally ethnic education, and the wonderful pre-WW2 sight of us Brits wheeling wheelbarrows of money around for bread when the foreigners of a couple of generations will be driving around in posh cars as they do now. It will not be a case of not spot the white face, but spot the white face driving, not. We have a couple of generations of our own ethnicity marrying out, thinking out, and even worse, not thinking at all. We have many who just go abroad to live, and why not? Families are expendable in these modern times, just as loyalty is, and if one doesn't believe in something, does that mean there is nothing to believe in? I was talking to a lady today who was delivering a parcel next door for a web company, and in the course of conversation, I learnt she had an autistic daughter and a husband who was very ill. In fact, now the norm for this country. If autism had never been diagnosed, what would these kids have been? Circus freaks or village idiots? She voiced all the concerns that affect the working class nowadays, foreigners driving better cars, getting better treatment on our NHS, putting their kids into already overcrowded schools, and getting council accommodation much sooner than the average Brit. Outbreeding, outbuying and outworking us has slipped away somewhere, but it was there. She also told me something I didn't know, that already hundreds of white children have been removed from their parents in Borden by the local council. It's been going on for years, as in other places in this country, an ethnic cleansing of young white children of both sexes. The reason for this, apparently in one case, it was the fact that the children were not clean, and all six of this mother's children have been removed. Clean? What's clean when you're a child? There are varying degrees of cleanliness, and in good old days a white round the face with a dirty cloth sufficed. Not starving, not abused... Not tortured or killed in some weird African ceremony from the Dark Ages and the Dark Continent. Not mutilated or circumcised, but not clean. Actually, what this means in Brit New Speak is that for years we've been taking white children out of their homes, putting them into so-called care systems so that they can be abducted, abused and pimped out by the ever-growing Muslim communities in this country. A sort of soylent sex green meals on wheels for Islam, which has been under the carpet for years, but still achieving its aim of keeping whites from overbreeding and satisfying the Islamic wish for total domination over a foreign country's future. Wonderful, isn't it? Of course, when it comes to child protection, the CPA only have to listen to one salutary story from down in the southeastern regions of our own country. This guy is a BMP member, and believe it or not, apparently a local councillor. Now, no names, of course, as this is hearsay, third hand, and without prejudice, but this guy is sexually harassing another female member in his region. It's been going on years, and despite complaints to the ex-SERO passed on to the nasty guy's organiser and mentor, who runs cheap hotels and is a close friend of a London organiser, nothing has been done about it. Putting it down to a chick thing. This is where nationalism is not good for women. You fit into either two categories, old and past it, or beware you will become the party bicycle. One of the stories from the complainant, who previously had a friendship with this guy, concerns his daughter, who is eight. He is trying to bring her up as a boy because he didn't have boys and her request at a toy shop for a te girly teddy was shouted down. He also made her watch a YouTube video of a drag queen playing with a dildo. Fact. 
And will she be removed from that home? No. The home is probably clean and the father is a PC pervert who fancies himself as a Bob Marley reincarnation and attends, apparently, chilly and ecstasy male-only parties. He sounds like a model for the new multisexual revolution going on in this country. And this guy is in the BMP. He should fit right in with what is left there now. He's in good company. Believe it or not, the head of membership is now a young girl who had our ex-SERO down as councillor new guy for months and wondered why he didn't get what pathetic updates they managed to shove out. That is, one in six months. So this is the brave new world of the Marxist proletariat, is it? Cleanliness next to godliness. Do these people troll round the newcomers' houses and check their children are not all of the above plus? No, they wouldn't dare. And they wouldn't dare if a nationalist government or at least a nationalist ethos was in place. So the Brits have lost out big time to the new world order of the mud people. And in a way, it's a joint fault. That of us trusting the wrong people and clearly not grabbing the right attention at the right time. And the powers that be who didn't want any European Christian power having any sort of pull in the future world. But countries need nationalism, and we need it more than most, despite the awful figures of attendances and interests in the last few years. I just hope that we nationalists can remain true to our cause long enough to be of interest to a group of people who could actually make it work. Or, of course, that could be the whole plan. But when we die, who will take our place? It is time for the people to stop thinking about the latest gadget for their kitchens and start wondering how long they will have those kitchens. And finally, some humorous points for the weekend. Why doesn't Tarzan have a beard? Why do we press harder on a remote control when we know the batteries are flat? Why do banks charge a fee on insufficient funds when they know there's not enough money? Why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? Why does someone believe you when you say there are four billion stars, but check when you say the paint is wet? Whose idea was it to put an S in the word lisp? What is the speed of darkness? Why is it that people say they slept like a baby when babies wake up every two hours? Are there specially reserved parking spaces for normal people at the Special Olympics? If the temperature is zero outside today and it's going to be twice as cold tomorrow, how cold will it be? Do married people live longer than single ones or does it only just seem longer? How is it that we put man on the moon before we figured out it would be a good idea to put wheels on luggage? Why do people pay to go up tall buildings and then put money in binoculars to look at things on the ground? Did you ever stop and wonder who was the first person to look at a cow and say, I think I'll squeeze these pink dangly things here and drink whatever comes out? Who was the first person to say, see that chicken there, I'm going to eat the next thing that comes out its bum? Why do toasters always have a setting so high that could burn the toast to a horrible crisp which no decent human being would eat? Why is there a light in the fridge but not in the freezer? Why do people point their wrist when asking for the time but don't point their bum when they ask where the bathroom is? Why does your obstetrician, gynaecologist, leave the room when you get undressed if they're going to look up there anyway? Why does Goofy stand erect while Pluto remains on all fours? They're both dogs. If quizzes are quizzical, what are tests? If corn oil is made from corn and vegetable oil is made from vegetables, then what is baby oil made from? If electricity comes from electrons, does morality come from morons? Why do the alphabet song and Twinkle Twinkle Little Star have the same tune? Stop singing and read on. Do illiterate people get the full effect of alphabet soup? Did you ever notice that when you blow in a dog's face he gets mad at you, but when you take him on a car ride he sticks his head out the window? Does pushing the elevator button more than once make it arrive faster? Hmm. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and a very safe weekend. <laughs>